Happy afternoon, happy afternoon. Come on in, hit that like button. Let me know where you guys are checking in from. Pop-up afternoon edition. Pop-up afternoon edition Monday. How's everybody doing? Not really expecting a lot of people this afternoon because it is a Monday. It is the middle of the it is the middle of the afternoon. And I know people are working uh, so that they can, you know, take care of their families and pay their bills. But I wanted to pop on this afternoon because I got the energy and I just didn't want to do it tonight. So I'll put the content out. People can watch the replay. This live stream uh, was something that was requested. I actually kind of talked about cross docking. I think I did. A, I did do a live stream um, last year about cross docking and reverse logistics, but people still, you know, occasionally ask about it. Why are people calling me? Hold on one second. But people still occasionally ask about it. Um, and I direct them to, you know, to go look through that old content, but yet and still I get requests. So I'll revisit cross docking today, this afternoon, I should say. So come on in, hit that like button. Let me know where you're checking in. Let's get this roll call out the way and then we can get to it so I can get out of here and you guys can go on about your day. Feeling a little bit better than I was last night, so that's a good thing. Shout out to Mark Brown. Jakar, oh, let me pull this out the way. Jakar says, Mark, you're the mother effing man. I always watch and listen to your live since I worked the graveyard shit. Y'all probably can't see that on YouTube because YouTube probably filtered out the bad word. But shout out to you, Jakar Green. Appreciate you checking in. Appreciate you tapping in. I was so close to getting my truck registered um, today. Paid my down payment at 530 this morning after work. But it's not updated on FMC website yet. Tomorrow, though. Yep, just be patient and they'll update it. Make sure your insurance, <coughs> if you got your insurance, make sure your insurance broker makes the proper filings as well. If the insurance agent or broker doesn't make the proper filings, you're not going to go active, all right? So come on in, hit that like button, let me know where you guys are checking in from. All right, so really quick live stream on cross-docking. Um, last night I did a live stream on um, can you afford to run your box truck business? And I think I watched the replay of that twice. I think I really cooked last night with that. And, you know, I was sick. I'm coughing. But I think the information that I gave out and the way that I presented it last night was probably one of my best live streams, I think, to date. I think a lot of value was given last night. Um, and I think a lot of people will, you know, take some of that information and uh, process it the correct way and, um, and, uh, you know, and 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 they'll if they process it the right way and they implement it into their business, they'll be able to make the proper changes to ultimately see success in their business. I gave you guys the blueprint. I use myself um, as an example. I was woken awoken this morning. Kirk woke me up. Um, like, man, did you read the comment section? So there's always going to be people that. I don't want to necessarily call them haters, but people that may disagree with, you know, the way maybe you present things. Um, because what happens is, is when you're presenting something, when, when you see an issue, right, and then I do a lecture to kind of, you know, help people overcome the issue that I see that's affected a lot of people, what happens is, the, the, the lecture that I may be given, it's hidden home to some people. Some people take heed to it and they'll say, hey, man, I feel like you were speaking directly to me. This is something that I know I need to work on. Or this is something I need to work on. And then some people take offense to it, all right, because the truth kind of cuts deep. Um, and that's unfortunate that people uh, can watch a whole lecture, a whole two hour and 50 minute lecture and take one thing forget all the, the 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 good stuff all the good stuff all the stuff that i'm cooking i'm cooking last night all the good stuff that you could take and implement that into your business 
All right. So that you could go to the next level. But you take one little small thing and run with it. So I want to I want to I want to read this <coughs> and see. See if I'm what what the hell I did. So this is a comment from last night's. Oh, okay, I think the person replied. Hold on. Oh no, they they did reply, but I guess they deleted it. All right, so wow. Oh, let me share it. Let me share my screen because man, I I don't know, man. People be tweaking. People be tweaking, and I don't get it. Hold on, let me my share screen button. There. All right, bet. <sighs> Let me blow this up. This bottom comment. Can I blow it up? Let's pull this up here. Wow. I thought of you more like a more humble and smart dude. My guy, 1300 for a pair of shoes only. I don't care how much money you have. Not a smart move, buddy. So last night I did a live stream on... You know, can you afford your box truck business? I think a lot of the problem that people have with why they ride from the sustainability of their business, if you didn't watch last like nice last year, I think you should go watch it, is because their living expenses far outweigh what their business is bringing in to the point where they can't pay themselves enough to maintain the current lifestyle that they had entering into the box truck business, right? And ultimately, they rob from the sustainability of the business to be able to afford to continue that lifestyle. And I'm not speaking on an extravagant lifestyle. I'm just speaking on living in general. The cost of living is very expensive. And the best way for me to present that lecture, I use myself as an example in the current state. So I use my current living expenses. I live, I use my current living expenses and I, I presented that, that live stream yesterday. Uh, Something that I normally don't do, but I wanted to show people that if I were entering into the box truck space, right, right now, with the current rates running hard six days a week, all right, running six days a week on a contract for bigger, bulky final mile is going to bring me in about $20,000 a month. Entering right now, currently, what my living expenses are, my basic living expenses, I wouldn't be able to afford to continue to live um, how I live because that business wouldn't bring in enough money that if I ran it efficiently and effectively, I wouldn't be able to pay myself enough to, to live the way I live. Right. So I use myself as an example. And I think looking at my, my, my numbers as an example, I guess that kind of cut this person, you know, and I talked about, you know, that's basic. And I said, if I go shopping or if I take a trip, then that ten to eleven thousand dollars a month can easily go to fifteen hundred, sixteen hundred, whatever. And I use an example because if I go to a store, a pair of shoes could be a thousand, twelve, thirteen, whatever. You know what I'm saying? And I guess you know it it it, it, it cut. But what 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 I don't understand is the reason that people go to work, and this is just work in general, not not necessarily running a business. Go to work, run a business, whatever. The the point that the people get up every day and bust their behinds and work hard so that they can afford themselves a comfortable way of living to be able to pro provide themselves with the things that they want to do. All right. As long as you're doing what you're supposed to do and, and you're being responsible um, on how you spend your money, then if you're working and you are bringing that money in, you do what you want to do. I'm not going to never get mad at a person because they busted their behind to get to a certain point that they can afford to live comfortably at a certain point. All right. What, 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 and this person has been subscribed to me for a while. So like a lot of the stuff that I was talking about last night, it's not new. Like people know this stuff, you know what I'm saying? People know these things. So he, you know, Humble? How 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 am I not humble? I sit up here every day when I come on live stream in a white t shirt or a black t shirt. I mean, if you go watch some of your favorite content creators in the space, you see Gucci, you see Burberry, you see people doing you know you know shorts and stuff with them in their personal life when they're going to the store and when they're out and about, you know, showing you their lifestyle. I don't do none of that. Can I do that? Sure. I can. 
do I do it? No. So when I look at a comment like that, it just lets me know that the information that I was given last night cut Buddy pretty deep and he felt affected by it that he had to go write a comment that doesn't make sense because you're talking to the guy that can really sit up here and be cocky and sit up here in, 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 in nice clothes and things like that and can show you wardrobe and can show you lifestyle, but I don't do it. I come on here all the time in my white T-shirt. Why? Because I'm in the crib. Like, what am I going to dress up and I'm in the crib for? So the information I was given, obviously it affected that person. They're guilty of not, you know, running their business efficiently and effectively. The whole point of last night's live was for you to look at your your living expenses and parallel that with your business income so that you can see what the numbers are and make the proper adjustments so that you can run your business efficiently and effectively. But people take things out of context because it hits close to home and then they take one small little thing from the live stream and they blow that out of proportion instead of what the whole two hours and 50 minutes was about they just all just that whole thing which just didn't exist so the internet is a weird 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 place but you know shout out to do like i don't know who wants to you know work hard every day whether you work at corporate america whether you're you know starting a business and you go to work to just remain poor like people want you to remain poor so you can misery loves company what would i be like sitting up here telling people how to be successful in a box truck business poor does that make any sense i know what it's like to be poor why because i was poor I know what it's like to really be poor. The stuff people make fun of people about being poor, I was that person growing up. I could tell you about mice running through the crib. I could tell you about roaches running through the crib. I could tell you about wearing pro wings. Who knows about pro wings? See, some of y'all, y'all don't know about that. I could tell you about me being made fun of for wearing pro wings, going home, mom, you got to get me a pair of Nikes. Mom, you, you got to get me a pair of Nikes, you know? I could tell you what that's like. So when people go to work and they're bust their behind, they're busting their behind so that they can afford themselves to do the things that they want to do and live a comfortable life. So person's supposed to stay in the hood forever. What's the point of working? What's the point of me starting that business in 2010, climbing up on them trucks, falling off them trucks, throwing my shoulder out, falling off, bending my leg back, twisting my leg, working a whole summer with a dislocated shoulder, coming home every day, muscle pains, waking up stiff every single day because I did three, four moves the day before. Why, why did I do all of that? What was the purpose of me doing all that? So I could continue to be poor and live in a room, a bedroom in my mama's crib? This is why I don't feel bad for people that have poor mentalities. Because misery loves company. I'm not going to be in, in, in your company. I'm going to continue to tell people what it takes and give them the information that it takes so that they can take their business to the next level so they don't be in company of people like you that leave comments like that. It's ridiculous. So, I know what it's like to be poor. It's not fun. So, you know, whatever I need to do to... <laughs> <laughs> remain from not being poor and that's what I'm going to do and that's what we talk about on this channel I talk about competitiveness competitiveness in business how and this is a very competitive business I'm going to outwork you if I come into something and we got to compete for a low I'm going to outwork you I'm going to make sure that my business is set up so that I can underbid you 
if I'm running middle mile so that I can get the load and you won't. If I'm running final mile, I'm going to put myself in a position where I can leverage myself that I can get the best runs in that warehouse that are going to give me the most stops in the shortest distance and have them send you way out to the boondocks where it costs you more money to run. Because I don't want to go back to wearing pro wings again. So if I have to beat you up in business to prevent myself from digressing in life, then that's what I'm going to do. And it's not rude or it's not mean. It's just shrewd business because business is cutthroat. A lot of people that I talk to that came into business with just a nice, wholesome mentality, those are the people that's, that realize that business is cutthroat. And it not, it's not cutthroat to the point where you're cheating people. It's just an aggressive behavior, an aggressive nature that you 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 got to have. There's no friends in business. You know, for me to scale the way I, I scale, it, it came from hard work and an aggressive nature. And then, you know, going back to that, what, you know, people got to realize is like what this guy is worrying about, you know, my expenses. You got to remember, and I've said it many times, Mark is not married. Mark don't have no kids. My, my I can afford to live a certain type of way because I don't have the responsibilities that another person may have. And that's something that people have to think about when they're investing into a business. The numbers are the numbers. Men lie, women lie, numbers don't. Most people that come into a box truck business, the average is about $5,000 a week. And I did these numbers last night. So if you know you got a family at the crib, you know, once you look at your numbers, it's a certain amount of money that I have to make to be able to sustain this household. So going into that, man, can this business bring in enough money that business can be cash flow positive? I can pay myself enough to sustain my household and pay Uncle Sam. What are the sacrifices that I'm going to have to make to be able to do this? People ain't making no sacrifices and in turn, they're robbing from the sustainability of the business. But me using myself as an example so people can look at the formula to know how to take it back to their, you know, you know, their business and their life and look at that formula and kind of mimic it and input that those numbers, you know, that are their real numbers. He's looking at my, my numbers and, and saying, I'm not humble because I busted my ass. So you want me to be poor. You want me to stay poor. I, I don't, I don't, I don't get it. I, I don't get it. <laughs> I don't get it. But let, let, let's talk about, you said homie in the comment. Only talk. Yeah, see, that's the one part he took out out of the whole two hours and 50 minutes. You know what I'm saying? But it is what it is. And guess what? This guy's been subscribing for a while. I've looked at all the comments he wrote. You know, and that's why he said, well, I thought you like more of a humble whatever. But, you know, I'm the guy sitting up here in my white T-shirt in the middle of the afternoon. If you want me to turn up, I could really turn up. I could really turn up. <coughs> but I don't. Because I, I said it before, like, me showing my lifestyle and the things I do for fun and capturing those moments and bringing them online, what good is that going to do for people that are coming to me to learn to, to learn information to ultimately make them more of a successful business owner with their box truck? That would just be me rubbing it in your face. And I see other people do it all the time. That's just not the way I go about things. I don't even have a personal Instagram. I didn't have a personal Instagram until I created one a, a, a Instagram for this YouTube. Prior to that, I don't have a personal Instagram. I'm from an era where we, you know, we move in silence. I don't need people to know where I'm at, dropping my location when I go to funny dinners, taking pictures of the meals, taking pictures of receipt. To me, that's goofball shit. I don't do that. It ain't nobody's business how I move. You see what I'm saying? So 
I think Buddy is tweaking, and for that, he got to get the goofy button. Yo, goof ass. Goofy as hell. Yo, goof ass. All right, so, man, let's get to it. All right, so today we're going to be talking about cross-docking and um, reverse logistics. And I covered this before, but I guess somebody wants me to talk about it again. So once again, I'm going to use myself. I'm going to use my warehouse, all right, and I'm going to use pictures from when I was cross-docking in my warehouse, and I'm going to talk about cross-docking. So hopefully this dude doesn't get mad, you know, because... I busted my ass, whatever. I, I don't care. No homo. Or pause. Sorry, can't say that no more. So pause. All right, what is cross-docking, the process, the final mile, and reverse logistics? Let's get into this. <clears throat> and I presented this before, but we're going to present it again, I guess. Um, all right, so let's pull it up. Let me pull myself up. All right, so what is cross-docking? Cross-docking is a practice in logistics of unloading materials from a manufacturer or a mode of transportation directly to the con to the customer or consumer or another mode of transportation with little or no storage <coughs> in between all right cross docking what's the difference between cross docking and warehousing all right so let's break that down cross docking is the unloading of goods directly from incoming transport to outbound transport with little ideally none Long-term storage in between while warehousing is designed to keep stock on hand until it's purchased and needs to be delivered. All right, so boom, when I started cross-docking, I was cross-docking with a company called Nonstop Delivery. All right, Nonstop Delivery is a logistic company that deals with uh, people such as myself that have warehouses that they can middle mile the freight to. And from there, um, <coughs> we would run at the final mile to the consumer. So instead of me sending trucks every morning to a 3PL warehouse like RXO or T-Force or something like that, because I have a warehouse, the stuff gets middle mount to me across dock, and then we turn around and deliver it the final mount as quickly as possible. Cross docking exists because companies like Nonstop Delivery, instead of them making, they it, it increases their footprint without them investing money into labor and warehouse spaces so basically what they do is they go out they source retailers right they bid on contracts for retailers and they say hey we can get your freight delivered at this cost and here's our footprint across the united states of our warehouses and our cross dock locations all right warehouses are the warehouses that they they own and operate Right, and they fulfill freight in and out of cross docks are people like me that have a warehouse that they can send freight to. They don't own the warehouse. They don't they don't have to pay any of the 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 the, the things that are associated with the warehouse, heating it, um, lighting it, uh, security, insurance, things of that nature. <clears throat> they don't have to pay to man the warehouse, the labor. They just say, Hey, we got all these accounts, you got a warehouse, we'll middle mile you the freight. But we're going to use your cross dock and present it to the retailers as a footprint, a footprint of space that we occupy in this market to get freight to the consumer. All right. So it's a smart way of them putting the making a bigger footprint right to the retailers without uh, consuming the cost of it. All right. So they would middle mile me the freight. I would get anywhere from on an average day, five to seven trucks a day from different <coughs> companies, you know, um, yellow was probably the main one that came. So yellow, um, Holland, which is under yellow, um, FedEx freight, um, us direct would come. They got their own trucks out of Maryville. Um, say, uh, some, and the other companies that don't even exist anymore. A lot of companies that we were getting freight from, went out of business either in the 2019 crash or throughout the pandemic yellow just went out of business recently. So, um, but we get like five to seven trucks a day in and freight would come in, we would unload it. And then it was my job to turn that freight around, not to house that freight for a long period of time to get it in inbound it and outbound it as soon as possible within the next few days. You know, we would have the warehouse management system, that nonstop delivery provided. So I would see the inbound orders. I once the I once the orders came, 
I would inbound them in that system. And then it would be my job to call the customers and set up time frames and time windows to ultimately deliver the goods. Um, warehousing is when you receive items in and you hold it for a long period of time until a consumer buys something. All right. So it's a difference. Cross docking and stuff is already bought. It's just, you know, it's just transferring it from one place to another via truck. And then once it gets to my cross dock location, we take it the final mile. All right. All right. So like I said, this is the process. Um, shipper, middle mile, right? Middle mile runs into a cross dock. I'm a cross dock. And then it would sit in my warehouse for a day, two, three days, whatever, how long it took for me to get in contact with the customer, route it, you know, what areas we're covering on certain days. You know, the customer didn't have a say so on what day they would get to deliver. I would call and say, hey, <clears throat> you know, we got your dining room set from Wayfair. Um, we have a truck covering that area Thursday. Your window is going to be between nine and one. All right. So it's up to them to figure out who's going to be there. They don't get a chance. Well, I'm not going to be here. Well, if you're not going to be there, what day are you going to be there? Well, we don't cover that area that day. So they would have to, you know, you know, figure out how they were going to have somebody there <coughs> to receive the freight. So we dictate the terms of the day, the time of the delivery. All right. So we would run at the final mile ultimately to the consumer. This is my backyard of my warehouse. This was a truck that was coming in from direct buy out of Maryville. We also had direct buy. Direct buy is a company that has an online store. They have their own trucks. So their trucks were delivered to me once a week. I really didn't like running for direct buy because everything that was from direct buy was, it was just a hassle. It was just big stuff that was a hassle. And I just really, when that truck would pull into the yard, I just, you know, it would just always grind my gears. All right, so what's needed to operate um, a cross dock, right? <coughs> First, you're going to need a warehouse, which is going to be your big, biggest expense. Um, you know, to rent a warehouse can be costly, so you're going to need it. Um, that's going to be your big ex expense. The next big ex expense is going to be probably your forklift. Um, a used forklift I got up here, go for about $16,000. My forklift at that time was a Komatsu. Um, I ended up getting a forklift. I like to use my resources. Um, I didn't go out and buy a forklift. Uh, my, my commercial landlord who had that warehouse prior to me, he had two forklifts. One of them didn't work. He didn't want to put the money into getting it fixed. Uh, you know, he said, well, if you get it fixed, then you can use it. I'm not going to charge you for it. But if you spend the money to get it fixed, it's yours. And when you're done with it, just return it. So I sent a, a tow truck to go pick it up. Um, they brought it back to my warehouse. I call U.S. Crown or U.S. Lift. I call U.S. Lift. I call U.S. Lift um, to come out. <coughs> U.S. Lift charges a $150 an hour to fix it and that starts from the moment they leave their facility so the moment they leave their facility i'm paying 150 for an hour for them to come see me a 20 minute drive they still charge me for an hour so before he even gets there i'm already at 150 i mean one time you know he didn't have the part so he was like i gotta go back get the part and then come back and that whole time i was still on the clock so having a forklift is very expensive because, you know, it, it breaks. You know, you're using it. <coughs> you're lifting heavy things on and off trucks. Um, So, you know, it breaks and it's very expensive to fix it because of the labor. So you got a forklift, a good use forklift can range anywhere from fifteen to $20,000. On the U side, you're going to have to have pallet jacks, pallets. Um, you can build your pallet collection as freight comes in it's palletized so you just save those pallets pallet straps i'll show you what pallet straps are later um pallet straps are going to come in handy when you have to do reverse logistics shrink wrap shrink wrap is going to come in handy when you have to do reverse logistics you're going to use a lot of shrink wrap a lot of tape your warehouse management software to be able to locate where what items are where what you have in your warehouse at any specific time i didn't have to purchase a third party um 
warehouse management software because it was provided to me via the company that I was cross docking for. So because I was cross docking directly and solely only for that company, um, I was able to utilize their warehouse management software for my um, warehouse pallet racks. Um, I had a racking system but I didn't use it. Actually, we cleared out the racking system that was in the middle of the floor. We left the ones that's, that boarded the walls. The reason why is because I utilized the floor space to house it. It was just easy for me than having a pallet jack running around, lifting stuff up, setting it on racks. It was just easy to just leave the stuff on the floor. 20,000 square foot warehouse with the amount of freight that I had coming in and while I was pushing it out, <clears throat> you know, I didn't, I didn't have to put things in the air so to speak. I was, it was coming in and I was pushing it right back out. There was times where the warehouse did get overcrowded, but um, that was due to like veterans distribution, refusing to do reverse logistics for Home Depot. And then they dropped all those orders on me. And then reverse logistics, you have to put in an order for a company to come pick up the stuff to take it back to the shipper. And that process sometimes can take some time. <coughs> excuse me so sometimes things would build up that were looking to go outbound while freight was coming in inbound monday through friday so all right pallet racks um office supplies because you're doing a lot of printing because you have to give those bols uh to the driver because customers have to sign off mark any damages things of that nature put right notes um so a lot of ink a lot of paper, um, dumpsters, all right? So another expense, <clears throat> dumpsters. I know if y'all watched the Rob episode, how he talked about how he was fly dumping stuff in an abandoned building. He was like, well, Mark, you had dumpsters. You know, I had dumpsters. You got to pay for the dumpsters. So I had a eight yard or a 10 yard, the big, long, I think it was eight yard or 10 yard. I had an eight yard, 10 yard recycling dumpster. I had an eight yard, 10 yard garbage dumpster, and then I had a two yard garbage dumpster. Eventually, I got rid of the eight, 10 yard garbage dumpster. I just had the two yard <coughs> garbage dumpster and the eight to 10 yard recycled dumpster because a lot of that was just cardboard. Um, and that cardboard for the reverse logistics is recyclable, and a recyclable dumpster is a lot cheaper than a garbage dumpster, way cheaper. So, uh, with the amount of freight that we were pushing out and picking up, I would have to have two pickups a week. So I had to increase my pickups to two a week. So I eliminated one dumpster. It was just cheaper for me to eliminate one dumpster and have multiple pickups than to have two dumpsters for one pickup a week. So two pickups a week with a 10-yard recycled dumpster and a two-yard garbage dumpster. All right, so these are the basic necessities that you're going to need. If you're looking in the cross docking, all right. So here are some pictures of some some items that, <clears throat> at the time, I got a lot of pictures from that time period because I had to take a lot of pictures when things were coming off the middle mile trucks because a lot of the things that would come off were damaged. And the main company that I had issues with was ugh, Yellow and all the Yellow subsidiaries, um, YBF, YBF or YB whatever. Yellow, Holland, all those white yellow subsidiaries, <coughs> they just mishandled stuff during the middle mile. So I had a lot of pictures that I had to take to, you know, either refuse when it came to me or take the picture knowing that we inbounded this freight already in this condition and we can't see um, beyond the, 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 the wrapping or the boxing if the actual merchandise inside is damaged. So here was a big ottoman that came in. As you can see, it had a hole right here and it had a snag on the side. These black things that you see running across, those are band straps. That's what I talked about earlier. So you're gonna need those for reverse logistics because let's say we delivered this, which we never delivered this item. The reason why we never delivered this item, this item sat in my warehouse for two years before I ended up just selling it or giving it away. Uh, we could never get in contact with the person who ordered it. Uh, we could never get in contact with them. They never returned any voicemails. I contacted nonstop over and over and over again. After about so many months, <clears throat> they put it in as a, um, 
for a pickup, well, they never put it in to be picked up. So my like, customers responded, and they ended up taking it off the dashboard, and it just became a ghost, and they never sent a, a, a truck to pick it up. Me, I just let it sit. We pushed it in the corner, <clears throat> and we just let it sit, sit, sit. After a couple years, listen, y'all don't want this stuff, clearly. These people ain't called. It's a ghost now. No one knows it exists. It's been two years. I'm selling it. Made me some money. So I had a bunch of stuff that I was able to sell or give away that either came back in the reverse logistics or we could just never get in contact with the customer. So that's one of the perks of, I guess, running across that facility. You come across a lot of things that um, either are told to you to d- to discard of or become a ghost because the customer never responds. The logistics company doesn't put an order in to pick up or the shipper says, discard because they don't want to they don't want to incur the cost of shipping them back something that's on reverse that's that was reverse logistics all right so as you can see this is our big ottoman it's palletized and it's banded to the uh pallet <clears throat> here's some more items that came in off a truck this looks like a sectional set a cheaper sectional this is from wayfair um this is how the box came in off the truck i can't remember what uh, trucking company delivered this but this is how it came in we accepted it obviously I took pictures submitted it to non-stop uh, alright so here's me pulling something or somebody pulling something off uh, a truck with the forklift obviously I got a picture because it came off obviously you can see the truck here uh, forklift obviously and you can see us pulling it off the truck already damaged so taking a picture of that to submit to the company so that when we deliver this if it's damaged once we get it there and white glove and unbox it you know the customers obviously gonna refuse it but we're not gonna be held liable for that claim <coughs> over here to the right you see a stack of uh uh massage chairs these are massage chairs on any given time i could get 50 of these chairs at a time these chairs go for about five thousand dollars a chair and we would deliver these directly to customers home but most of the time when these massage chairs came in from human touch we would deliver them to us um electronics place here right outside of chicago uh it's called abf not abf what's the name of that company um Oh shit, man! I can't think of the name of that company, but it's a it's a privately owned furniture company, electronics company, right outside of Chicago, and they sell these chairs. Um, and we would most of the time when these chairs would come in, we would deliver it to them. Um, here's a bunch of flooring that came in one time. Um, uh. <coughs> This is just to give you an idea of, you know, how freight would come in, uh, how it would need to be wrapped to the pallet. Uh, let's see. Ooh. All right. Um, more damaged freight, as you can see. So I got plenty of pictures of freight that was coming in damaged. It's just every day. So. You know, huge chair right here in the box. This is like it was a sofa. This is a table. <clears throat> you see how they delivered it? How they put it on like a, a wooden pallet and then they stacked three pallets up and then they had it wrapped and then they set it there. This is how it would come in off the truck. Um, so you need a forklift for this. Um, this is a pool table. This particular pool table, I ended up giving it away. Um, because no one ever claimed it. No, actually, we did, what what happened with this one is the customer refused the delivery, and the logistics company never put in a BOL for reverse logistics, or it was told for us to discard it or whatever. But I'm not throwing away a brand new pool table. <coughs> with this pool table, I ended up giving it away. Um. I think because it had a tear in the box right there. Uh, more damage freight that came in. This right here, I believe, was a glass table. This picture in the middle. You see how they got it on the pallet? And then they got it fixated to the pallet. 
um, like kind of like they built like a horse to kind of transport it standing upright. I believe if I'm not mistaken, that was a piece of glass um, that sat on top of a stand of a glass table. Um, and if the customer, let's say, refused the delivery, I would obviously keep this pallet intact the way it is in case, you know, we got a call a week or two later to go back and pick this up. The customer wants to return it. And because this is how I would have to palletize it and package and prepare it for reverse logistics to ultimately send back to, I believe this came from Wayfair. <clears throat> if I'm not mistaken, I think this came from Wayfair. Um, these are just copies of BOLs from nonstop. Um, I cross people's personal information out, my information. Um, these are the BOLs that the customer have to sign. So this is why office supplies are, you know, required because you're printing a lot of paper. You know, any given day, depending on how many trucks I was running for this contract, it could be anywhere from 15 to 45 stops a day, which would equate to one to three trucks a day for this particular contract. And that's doing deliveries and reverse logistics. On most cases, I will have one to two trucks doing deliveries. And then I will have one truck just straight doing pickups. All right. So just more copies of VOLs. VOLs. Uh, more inbound freight that was damaged. This was obviously a mattress because it says Serta. Um, you know, to... <sighs> You know, cross docking, you have to make sure your checks and balances are in order because um, um, as you can see, a lot of stuff comes in damage. So you have to make sure you have pictures and you document everything. Some things you can refuse inbound. If it just looks too damaged and you can't, you know, you can see behind the packaging that the actual physical item is damaged. But if the packaging is damaged and you really can't tell if the physical item is damaged beyond the packaging you would inbound it take the pictures send the pictures to uh the company to notate <clears throat> yo this is what it is so when my crew gets to the customer if it is damaged we've already documented and and, and notated that inbound from whatever the middle mouth company was this is how we received it and we don't want to be held responsible or liable for the damages that occurred middle mile. Just more freight that came inbound damaged. More freight inbound. Actually, I showed y'all this picture. More freight inbound damaged. This right here on the right was a crushed velvet sofa. I ended up, uh, <coughs> they didn't want to pay for the freight to send it back to the shipper. So they told me to discard it. I ended up giving that sofa away to one of my employees. Um, now, this is reverse logistics. This is how an example of things that we would have to wrap in order to send back reverse. So as you can see, these are mattresses. Believe it or not, people return mattresses. So we would go out, deliver mattresses, and a week or two or three weeks later, people would call U.S. mattresses and say, hey, we don't like this mattress. It's not comfortable. We want to exercise our 30-day return policy, and we want to return this mattress. So the way the mattresses were delivered to us, as I showed you earlier, they were delivered in cardboard boxes. They were delivered in cardboard boxes, as you could see in this picture here. This is a certain mattress. <clears throat> Let me see if I got a picture of another mattress. Uh, uh, let me see. I think I do, but later on in the slideshow. <clears throat> All right, so we would go pick up the mattresses. Obviously, those cardboard mat um, boxes that the mattresses came in, I would utilize that. I never threw, I threw cardboard away, but I would keep enough cardboard <coughs> to package and wrap things if we had to pick things up. It's kind of hard to repackage a mattress once it's been taken out of the box. And it has to be palletized. It has to be palletized because the 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 the, the middle mile company that's picking up is a semi truck, and everything goes on the pallet. So this is how we would have to palletize mattresses. So as you can see in the picture to the left, that's a queen size mattress. We have to fold that down. So it would take two or three guys because we'd have to fold it down 
Someone would have to hold it down while someone tapes it on each end to keep it folded. And then we have to go around it with shrink wrap. Obviously, we set it on. Actually, that might be a king size because you see the two uh, box springs at the bottom. Actually, that may be a queen size with two custom twin size uh, <clears throat> box springs. We put the box springs on the bottom. We folded the mattress, put that on the top, wrapped it, and then we shrink wrapped everything together and then ultimately shrink wrapped it to the pallet. All right, same thing with the one in the middle. Same thing with the mattress on the far right side. This is how we would send mattresses back if we had to pick them up. And that's another view. So this is reverse of just something we ended up having to go pick up at a customer's home and ultimately ship it back to the manufacturer. Don't ask me what they do with used mattresses. I don't know. <clears throat> um, here's a sectional that came in that the customer refused. Uh, wasn't nothing wrong with this. I ended up selling this sectional. I forgot why the customer refused it at delivery. Oh, no, this wasn't a refusal. This was an actual return. Customer returned this. Um, the legit, the shipper didn't want it back. They told us to discard it. I ended up selling it. Here's a dining room. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. This is a, I don't know if this is a dining room table, a patio table. This is a patio table, an outdoor patio table <clears throat> that a customer that we delivered. And then the customer didn't like it. A week or two later, we had to send a truck to go pick it up. This is another item that the shipper didn't want back. So I ended up giving this particular patio set away. <clears throat> Sofa that came in that we had to go pick back up that we did have to ship back. You can see we wrapped it up nice and neatly, put it on the pallet to ultimately wrap it to the pallet, band it to the pallet for a middle mile truck company to come pick it up. And that is the end of that slideshow. So that's pretty much cross docking. You know, uh, I talked a little bit about it last night, how, you know, when you're cross docking, you're treated like a 3PL, you know, you're in a position that you have something that a lot of other people don't have. You got a warehouse. So um, the companies that you're going through, they pay you when they get paid. So a lot of times I would be running stops and the settlements that would be coming in during that pay period didn't equal to the amount of stops that I had to pay for labor for that pay period. So I might have <clears throat> spent $3,000 on labor for that pay period, right? But my settlement was for 800 bucks because I'm getting paid for freight that I might have delivered or picked up 120 days ago, you know? Uh, so now I would have to go into cash flow to cover the cost of that. And eventually... <clears throat> It caught up with me. There was a time frame where those settlements just weren't equating or even near the amount of freight we were running because we were steady at one point. And then when veterans said, yo, we're not doing no more Home Depot deliveries, I went from getting 20 to 30 orders in my system a day <coughs> inbound to one day logging on and I had 200 orders sitting there. And, you know, once we're doing all these orders, <coughs> It's increasing my cost to operate to pick this stuff up, which eventually they're going to pay me. But I'm running on a net 90, a net 120, and that's not consistent because these companies pay them when they feel like they get ready, and then they pay us when they get paid. So even that wasn't consistent. So like I said, I could have did so many orders that just my labor was two to $3,000, and that's not even adding the cost of fuel Right. And then I'm I'm out, let's say, four grand just for that one contract for this pay period. But my settlement is eight hundred bucks. And then so the settlement <clears throat> for me running that pay period might come four months later. When I was done with cross docking, I was still getting paid for eight months on a weekly basis. That's how far behind. They were paying me. I stopped cross docking in March. I was getting a settlement every week until the middle of October. That's how far behind they were with payments. So the money came, it just wasn't consistent with what we were running 
on a week to week basis. So at one point, I actually for my delivery company, that cross docking contract, it 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 drained all my cash flow. All right. So that was a dark time for me <clears throat> in business. That was one of my dark times. And I had to uh, borrow from the moving company. Thank God for the moving company to keep the trucking company afloat. All right, because they're two separate entities. So me taking from the moving company that was a sustainable business because we're dealing with consumers directly and the work that's being provided to the consumers on a day-to-day -day basis, we are being paid that day. Um, so I was taking that money, paying what I need to pay for the moves. Trucks are paid for, cost is low paying the labor, fuel, whatever, <clears throat> which is also be paying for itself because we're charging an hourly rate. And then whatever is left, taking that and covering the expenses on the trucking side, ultimately put me in a situation where I was unable to pay myself for, a, for like a damn near a year. A lot of the money from the cross docking uh, work um, I didn't see that until after I stopped cross docking. So that period from March until October where I was still receiving those weekly settlements, <clears throat> that was me recouping all the money that I invested plus my profit. My camera freezing up. I'm just going to keep talking. The camera going to freeze up, but it's going to pick back up. Somebody probably must be. I'm going to keep talking. You can hear me. The camera unseized. I'm not going to switch cameras. So, you know, that would that was me recouping the money that I invested and ultimately um, my profit. Um, I think cross-docking can be rewarding, but, you know, you got to have some money. You got to have some money um, put up. Um, because like I said, you're not going to see your money return to you that quick. And the initial investment, you're going to need all the stuff that I talked about uh, earlier in this live stream. Um, it was a learning experience for me. If I had to do it all over again, would I? Probably not. Probably not. Um, but it was a good learning experience. If If I had to do it all over again today, I wouldn't do it. I don't change and I don't want to, I, I don't, you know, everything that I've done <clears throat> throughout my career, I don't, wouldn't change nothing for the world because it's put me in a position where I can sit and talk to you guys with a vast amount of knowledge and experience, right? So I wouldn't change it. Would I do it now? Mm -mm. It's more work to me than it's worth at this point in my life back then. <clears throat> it was dope, you know, to be in my 30s and to operate a warehouse and, you know, go from where I started in a pickup truck to ultimately cross docking. It was something that I put under the resume. But at this point, you know, that's a lot of work. That's a lot of work. It's a lot of cost. And another thing I didn't talk about with the forklift other than the maintenance, the propane, you know, you got to steady put propane in that thing. <clears throat> um, it's just a lot of, it's a lot of that goes into securing the freight, securing security for the warehouse, dogs, feeding the dogs, pit bulls. You got to feed the pit bulls. You know, it's just, it's just a lot. You know, my warehouse is in the hood. It's in the hood, middle of the hood. It's not in an industrial area. Uh, you know, it's in the middle of the hood, a warehouse in the middle of the hood. In my neighborhood, the same zip code where my OG resides, where I, I grew up. <coughs> that's how I was in that. That's how I was able to put people from the neighborhood on. So, you know, you got to protect the warehouse. That costs money. You know, taking the dogs to the vet, getting them shots. That costs money. Feeding them. That costs money. So it's a lot of a lot of variables that go into play when it comes to cross docking. I know the video is freezing up, but I'm just going to keep talking. I'm not switching the camera. Uh, so yeah. So if there's any questions, I, I'll take a few questions and I'll get out of here. Just wanted to 
cover that. I try to cover request videos when I can. So if you got any questions, I'll take them. If not, then I'll, I'll skedaddle because I see the camera is freezing up for whatever reason. I don't know. Any questions? Any questions? Any questions? Any questions? Uh, Mark, thanks for the advice. And again, I've been putting it together on a moving helper job right now. That's what's up, man. Are you on moving helper? Yeah, I put that sauce out some months ago. Michael Savage says, good information. Oz, great for, great for again. He don't miss. Appreciate it. You're doing a good job, Mark. Appreciate it. <clears throat> as hard as you worked over the years, if you want to buy a 1300 pair of shoes, then buy yourself a 30 pair. Hey, man, you know, it, it is what it is. And that's, and here's the thing, like, and, here, and here's something funny. Like, shoes and things, there's a resale market for everything now. I got shoes. I got Jordans that I can resell for three times the amount that I bought them for. I got luxury shoes that I can sell for more than I bought them for. So when I buy shoes and things like that, if I want to, I can resell them. You know what I'm saying? You know, everything is for sale. You know what I'm saying? Everything is for sale. So, you know, at the end of the day, me last night just using myself as an example on how to put your numbers in place to determine <clears throat> where you need to sacrifice that, I just used myself as an example. Maybe I should have manufactured the numbers. Maybe that would have made this person feel better. But me being honest is just me being honest. But I guess I got to manufacture things so people can feel better because their situation is their situation. Your situation is not my situation. My situation is not your situation. I put myself in a position that I worked hard to be in the position that I'm at. Just is what it is. So you're absolutely a hundred percent right. You know, if you want to take a trip and you can afford to take a trip, take a trip. If you want to go out and buy a new car and you can afford to buy a new car, buy a new car. As long as you do it responsibly, you know what I'm saying. I know the video is freezing, but I'm gonna keep talking. So it is what it is. Uh, great Polo said, "Cooking for free, Pro Wings and Everlast." I've been there. <coughs> I think we all been there at some point. I think we all been there at some point, you know. But some people, they just like to talk about the ups. They refuse to go and talk about their pitfalls in business or their upbringing in life, you know what I'm saying? Um, me, I'm not ashamed <clears throat> of where I come from. That's why I can sit and comfortably talk to you about growing up and, you know, and being poor. <clears throat> It is what it is, you know. That was the driving motivator for my OG to get us up out of those situations and ultimately, you know, my driving factor to keep that 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 going from watching her and and working hard to be able to put myself in a position that I can do the things that I want to do and ultimately sustain. <clears throat> and I've had ups and downs in business and in life. You know, so you learn from your ups, um, you learn from your downs, and you take those those losing situations and those down periods in your life, and you take those as learning lessons, and, uh, you know, you turn yourself around, and you know what not to do to put yourself in that position again. And um, I think that's just life, you know. It is what it is. But, all right, I see there ain't no questions, so... Just wanted to talk about cross and I knew it wouldn't be interesting to a lot of people. So hopefully the people that ask me to do this live stream, they get this on the replay. I'm going to go nurse myself a little more. I see there's no questions. So I will catch y'all Wednesday for testimonials. Until then, I'm out.